Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted to welcome a very senior and accomplished professional from Scotland, but talking to us, uh, and she lives in Thailand, uh, talking to us from Scotland today, Liesl McDonald. Liesl, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Liesl is the owner of Spring and Atlas. She's a consultant, an angel investor, and a coach. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and an honorary fellow of the Marketing Society. And she's currently co-writing a book on all aspects of entrepreneurship. So Liesl, tell me about your journey in brief and a little bit about Spring and Atlas. Thank you, Ashtosh. Um, Spring and Atlas is a, a company name which um, comes from Spring. Spring, I've had companies named Spring for a quarter of a century now, and hmm. it really um, it tries to encapsulate our brand, which is about uh, growth and nourishment and uh, renewal. It's about nurturing uh, ideas, businesses and people, and it's about upward movement and the atlas part of it represents the not just the geographical spread because we do believe that the map is not the territory per se mm -hmm. which is a little twist mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's about diversity of thought and ideas as well as culture and people mm -hmm. so the spring and atlas being two disparate words research shows that people remember two disparate words in the name of a company so we've tapped into that insight for memorability mm -hmm. um my, my own uh, journey started um where I was picked up in the milk round from graduation to London. Um, mm -hmm. I was picked up by BT, which was then British Telecom, immediately post privatization. Mm -hmm. They were looking for international fast track graduates that were going mm -hmm. to be the leaders of the future. So I was mm -hmm. lucky. There were two from the UK, two from France, two from Holland, et cetera. I was one of the two from the UK. I was lucky enough, therefore, to start my career in the strategy department of mm -hmm. the biggest company in mm -hmm. Europe at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so we saw how all the business plans, we wrote the business plans. So we saw for the board. So we saw how everything came together strategically. Right. It was an absolute joy. Mm -hmm. um, I kept my little eyes and ears open and learned from the smartest and the best people in London at the time. Mm -hmm. I've then gone on from there to work in Ogilvy, briefly in the agency side and in Virgin. Um, I've been a CMO in a couple of countries. And then after a decade, just over a decade, I decided that my interests would um, be expanded by moving to Asia. So I've been mm. in Asia for over 20 years now. Wow. Um, and loved every minute of it. I was I lectured there. I've um, set up a company there and consulted across Asia from India to the Philippines mm. to Hong Kong, Singapore. Um, etc and um, my clients have been in lots of different countries so mm -hmm. my career is not so much one of um, success perhaps as knowledge and experience and mistakes accumulated and learned from mm -hmm. which I think is the best way to live a fulfilling and exciting mm -hmm. life but I've been surrounded by endlessly fascinating and smart people and for mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm privileged and it's taught me a lot. Yeah, yeah, very well said, very well said. So given your background and all the work that you've done across such a large geography or such a large part of the Atlas, what made you become a coach? Um, it's, it's, in, it's also interesting. It's not something that I sought to do. It's mm. something that has happened by dint of people asking me for help and support. So I do some coaching and I do mentoring as well. Mm. They're, they're, they're different. Uh, I never felt the confidence, perhaps, uh, mm. to say I'm going to be a coach and a mentor. But over the last, I guess, the last decade or so, I realized that a lot of what I was doing was coaching and mentoring mm. and have applied myself to trying to be the best one that I can. Mm. I don't coach and mentor many people because I feel that I am good at in specific contexts mm -hmm. and not in others. And it's really important to me that there's the right chemistry and the right relationship between the person seeking to be coached or mentored mm. and what I can offer um, to make it a success. I'm quite passionate about helping people from Southeast Asia, where I'm based, be successful globally. Mm. So I'd love for more voices to be heard. I'd love for them to be seen more, to be listened to more globally and I try not to take their place on stages, but I try to advocate and give people the tools as well to help them have mm. a voice internationally. 
There are amazing business people and brands in Thailand, for example, mm. that people don't, haven't heard of. Mm. Um, it's, it's, and with India as well, you know, there are so many success stories. Correct. But are they recognized globally? Are these people recognized globally? Mm. Um, so I'd love to see some more um, Asian and Southeast Asian brands and leaders really become well known because mm. what they have to say and what they have to offer mm. is invaluable. They're brilliant. Very well said. Very well said. And in all the work that you do with so many professionals and entrepreneurs, what are some of the common challenges faced by entrepreneurs and how do you help them overcome them? That's a very good question. Um, I think there's maybe three things. Um, the first thing, I mean, there, there's a lot of people who can talk very eloquently about the detailed channel, channel challenges. So product market fit, um, getting the right skill set on board as you, as you grow, etc. But the first question I always ask is, what are you trying to be? There are so many startups, there are so many founders out there now. Uh, and a lot of people's vision is this ideal that you'll set up a company and in less than 10 years time, you're going to have an exit for a ratio of X and then you're going to move on to the next thing. Mm. But when you start talking to founders, you find that some of them don't actually want to exit. Mm. So they might be thinking they're going to do fundraising and go to VCs and angels, mm. but they're not actually genuinely wanting to exit. Mm. What they're developing is a valid, successful business but there's perhaps a misconception about right. founder's journey other people will fail and i mean it's an honest fact that only one in ten founders will actually successfully exit their business or, right. or succeed in that business so i think people need to understand the difference between having you know an exit through acquisition or ipo building a successful business for which you might need funding, but you're not offering investors an exit. What you're offering is something else. And there's a number of things that that can be. Mm. Or maybe you're just going to be a business that's going to pay the bills for the two founders for the rest of your life and employ a few people from your community. And that mm. is also okay. It doesn't have to be this grand hero's journey. Mm. Um, the second thing I think leads into that, which is the ecosystem that we have at the moment. Mm -hmm in the entrepreneurial world, it's a little bit like skiing. 50 years ago, only a few people went skiing. They were kind of wealthy elite people yep. went skiing and not mm. the rest of us could afford it. Yep. Now everybody goes skiing. It's mm. been opened up and that's great. Access is great. Mm. However, what happens now is people are driven by the economy. It's a difficult economy right now. Mm. They're driven by the aspiration to be a founder because it seems quite cool and sexy at the moment to be a mm. founder mm. and the barriers to entry are lower but there's a lot of myths and legends developing around mm. this if you're going to have a lot of people skiing on the piste there has to be rules there has to be a shape to what happens mm. and i feel like the entrepreneur ecosystem has some challenges and opportunities that need to be addressed in understanding Who's coming into this ecosystem? What is best for them? What help and support do they need financially and, and otherwise? Mm. And what are the outcomes they are looking for? It's not all big exits. There are other ways of being Correct. successful. Correct. And th thirdly, I would say hard and soft advice, Ashutosh. So um, there's a lot of schools of thought out there. So lean startups or growth hacking or branding. And I hear entrepreneurs that I, 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 I mentor, I hear them a lot they've kind of latched on to a school of thought. Mm. And I think it's important for them to understand that there's lots of different ways of doing this. Mm. There's not just one way of doing it. Don't get hooked on a, a fad. Don't get hooked on a theory. What might be suitable for a tech startup mm. is not suitable for service organization, et cetera. So the lens, I help them, I hope, put a lens on what it is that they're trying to do and mm. focus because mm. there's a lot out there and it can be very, very confusing. Mm. Mm. What a great response, Lisa. Thank you so much. The other challenge, and I'm sure you've confronted this many times, is that entrepreneurs, everyone wants to go pan India, pan Thailand, global. And I keep telling them, you know, get, get some strength before you can start thinking of another city. I wanted to ask you, what do you believe are some of the critical factors for success in scaling a startup? 
That's another great question. Um, I, th I would agree with you. I, th I think there needs to be a uh, proof of concept. There needs to be revenue streams. There needs to be something solid before you start taking your gaze upwards and outwards. Mm. Um, and the timing of that is critical. Um, so I think there's, there's um, first of all, the numbers are important. Um, every time you look at growth, you get the hockey stick growth and the flatlining of the costs. I mean, that's just a classic thing that whenever you look at yeah. numbers you see and that's a mistake the numbers tell a story but there's other parts to that story and when mm. you're going out of your initial area that you know right. and you have customers that you might you know your low-hanging fruit customers so that would be the second thing is low-hanging fruit syndrome with scale-ups mm. you get the easy customers first there comes a point at which the next tranche of customers mm. will be the tougher nuts to crack the cost per acquisition will be higher you might not necessarily have the resources or the channels to get there to your point, when it's multicultural or moving into another area, mm. that's that's even more difficult because that's mm. not where your contacts might be. Right. You 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 don't really know the territory. Um so it's finding people who can help. What I what I say to people who are looking to do this to scale up mm. is don't panic about recruiting people mm -hmm. because you're Actually, your team is a little bit like a tree. So if you cut a tree and you have concentric circles mm -hmm. in that tree, you have yourself, maybe your co-founder, you might have a couple of advisors that you can tap into part-time, mm -hmm. usually a CFO or a lawyer, you know, somebody you need early yeah. on to give you good advice. And mm -hmm. I would always say get the best lawyer you can afford. That's a great piece of advice. Mm -hmm. But you don't need to necessarily employ people. You can have contractors, Correct. you can have advisors, you can have the other entrepreneur com the community that you can tap into. So mm -hmm. here in Scotland, there was a woman who did an amazing crowdfunding um, raise and she did it brilliantly. And she's now giving talks and talking to people on other ways of raising funds mm -hmm. other than um, VCs and angel groups. And so there's a, entrepreneurs have a, have a lot to offer each other. And I would say if you're looking at people looking at other markets, you need to expand that tree trunk. You need to expand those circles to involve mm. the cultures, the areas that you're looking to move into. Do it early. Don't operate for four years, become mm. revenue, and then suddenly say, I want to go to China. Mm. This is not a sudden decision. It's not right. a switch. Mm. You need to be building relationships, understanding who can help you, people who've been there, People from your culture who've gone there and people from that culture too. And that's another thing I get involved in through the Global Scott organization is helping plug in and, and, and people to build relationships in those territories that can help them. Fascinating. Thank you. My next question is how important is the role of failure in entrepreneurial growth? And it's often been said that it's, you know, places like Silicon Valley actually celebrates failure. But I want to get your perspective on what is the role of failure and how do you help entrepreneurs cope with failure? Uh, it's an interesting one. Uh, there's there's lots of um, controversial points about failure out there. I, yeah. I think that failure is necessary to learn. I think Buddha said that it's a part of life. If you don't fail, you don't learn. If you don't mm. learn, you don't succeed. Mm. So this is a fact. Um, there's two schools of thought, isn't it? There? There's the people who say they've never failed. And I suspect they're not telling the truth. And those are the people who celebrate failure perhaps a little bit too much and continually get funded, like some of the guys in Silicon Valley who failed spectacularly yeah. and yet still managed to go out. Whereas there are female and diverse founders who struggle to get the money. And that mm. breaks my heart because mm. the balance should lie in the middle. You, you, failure is going to happen. You have to learn from it. You have to just let it happen. Mm. Don't reject it don't embrace it just let it be yep. it will happen it's a thing in large organizations you have the luxury of using your resources to learn from failure so mm -hmm. I always used to say when I was CMO like 80 percent of our budget is to hit the target 10 percent is to test something where we might improve efficiency or effectiveness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then 10 percent is let's try something radical and see if we can make a step leap with what we're doing mm. it's difficult for entrepreneurs to do that but not impossible have a testing mentality so that you can 
plan to learn from mm -hmm. failures mm -hmm. and make sure that you've got measures and and checks in place so that yep. you know why things went wrong. Mm -hmm. So the only crime of failure is not knowing or understanding why it went wrong because then you're not learning. Other Correct. than that, it's all good. Well said, well said. And uh, the other aspect that I have often seen, especially with young startup entrepreneurs, is how do you develop leadership skills as their businesses grow? Because it's often been seen that entrepreneurs need to grow at least as fast, if not faster than their own organization. I'd love to get your perspectives. Yeah, it, it's a tricky one. I, And this is a personal view, but I think that leadership is part inspiration and part actually technically knowing how to manage mm -hmm. lots of fast moving parts mm -hmm. you have to have both of those skills mm -hmm. and I would always say to founders if you have those skills within your founding team if you have a founding team or yourself or your partner that's great mm -hmm. if not how do you tap into that so there are people who are technically brilliant. It's a cliche, but it's true, Ashtosh, right? There are people who are technically brilliant, but maybe not so great at the people side of things. Yeah. There are people who are exciting. Lots of entrepreneurs have this energy, this belief, this vision, this will, mm. which sometimes doesn't allow people joining the team to own it and be part mm. of it. I always say to them, it's like a door. You have to open the door to ownership of this business not financial ownership, but emotional ownership to feel part of it by allowing people that come into the organization mm -hmm. to feel like they own it. In, in right. Thailand, we were saying that you act like an owner or you act like a worker. So even if it's not your business, if you see someone in a restaurant, a waiter in a restaurant, who's making sure everything is tidy and clean and polished mm -hmm. and put away mm -hmm. and really conscious of the customers, we say he acts like an owner. Mm. and you need to encourage for me a huge part of leadership failure with entrepreneurs is mm. is that they fail to allow those people who come in to feel like they have ownership of this business that they can also be successful because the entrepreneurs are so focused and everything's often in their head and other people just feel left out so I, I think one of the critical aspects of leadership for entrepreneurs as they scale is letting people in and mm. feel ownership of that business mm. so that they too will be committed and driven and they have an attention to detail that will help as you scale because you can't have your eyes on it. Correct. Correct. Well said. The, the, the one, one more challenge I have seen with entrepreneurs is that when they decide to start scaling up, they need to start building on what I call a strong company culture. And a lot of startup entrepreneurs have told me that, oh, why must the company culture apply to me? I mean, there are some rules for the owner and some rules for, for the people who work for them. And I said, no, your company culture has to apply across the entire organization. What are your thoughts on how an entrepreneur can build a strong company culture? Another great question. It's difficult, isn't it? Because uh, you cannot build a fake culture and it works. Mm. So mm. you can read books about building company culture and you can have all kinds of events or uh, policies which you think might build a company culture. Mm. But really the company culture comes from the top, doesn't it? So mm. the person who's, who's leading has to be aware of how they affect that company culture. Right. I truly and genuinely believe in diverse thought when building a company culture. Mm. And a lot of companies fail because, you know, they say we hire people who are like us mm. in companies. It's doubly, triply, quadruply true of mm. entrepreneurs. Yeah. So it's easy. You've got people that you vibe with, people that you get along with. You have social, you have norms, you have all of these things which feel good because you don't have a different opinion mm. but you're unlikely to build a culture which will scale well mm. unless you have diversity now that can be gender it can be race it can be age it can be disability yeah. there's lots of different ways of thinking 
mm. about bringing something into your company culture, which is people who mm. bring a different perspective. I think a, a, a strong company culture in an entrepreneurial situation has to be a good balance of everybody buying into the vision, but with the ability to point things out mm. that need to be changed. Mm. If you cannot speak out, if the if the, the founders are not listening, yeah, you will miss things. I would say one of one of my when I'm doing consulting, business consulting, one of my core things, I'm the big red button people push when other people have tried to fix problems. I'm the one that they call when mm. things are in, in transit. So I I I see around corners is what has been said of me. And I think if you're an entrepreneur, you want to surround yourself with people who can see around corners. Mm. Seeing around corners means being able to speak out. As mm. a consultant, people are paying me money, so they're expecting to hear difficult things. That's okay. Mm. But when you're within the organization, as you know yourself, culture, corporate culture and entrepreneurial culture can sometimes tamp down voices of reason. Mm. And you miss mistakes that you could have avoided because people can't speak up. Mm. So having people who can speak up where there's not just one culture in the company per se. Mm -hmm. The company welcomes different voices, different perspectives. I think gives resilience. And, and that, I, I, I look for that when I look to invest myself. I look mm -hmm. for companies which have resilience in who these people are talking to. And again, it might not be employees. It might be their advisors. Mm -hmm. There's all different ways of bringing that mm -hmm. to that culture. But resilience is very important. And that mm -hmm. means truth, honesty. Openness. Well said. My time for two more questions for you. Can you share a success story of a startup you have coached or mentored that particularly stands out to you? Now, I um, would not really say that I have been critical yet. Mm -hmm. I have been in the investment. So in terms of coaching and mentoring, I've been doing that, investing and coaching and mentoring and that only for five years. So we're I'm, I don't have any grand exit um, mm -hmm. stories to tell. I do have a few companies that I'm mentoring and coaching right now who I think could be enormous, but I don't really want to out them and name them because... Okay. Um, it's a kind of a private relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. I, do, I do have some companies, I think, that are, um, there was a company here in Scotland called Skyscanner, which had a huge exit, which was a really good case study. Um, building a tech company, it's about airlines, um, fares, and um, really, really interesting case study in how to do that. And we have a lot of companies here in Scotland, which I get quite excited about. We're big in biotech, big in um, engineering, obviously, um, life sciences um, and there's a few of those that are coming up which mm. fingers crossed with a little bit of help from not just me but all the other people advising them keep a, we'll keep a watch on I'm them sure. I'm sure. wonderful and good luck with uh, all these companies I'm sure I'll look, look out for Liesl's name on the, out in the papers <laughs> to say you know so many companies have become unicorns because of your guidance but Liesl my last question to you looking ahead what are your goals and aspirations for Spring and Atlas? For Spring and Atlas, we are um, excited here at um, opening up some new challenges and some new avenues. Hmm. So continuing to be involved in the investment side of things through angel investing, mentoring, writing some articles, and I've got some papers that I, I'm writing. I'm really interested, Ashutosh, in, Ashutosh I'm sorry, in... Um, looking at the ecosystem and how it can be changed. So taking mm. a step up from companies and saying, how does the ecosystem work? Mm. There are government, there's government support. There are various organizations like banks, um, tech companies, which have a lot of accelerator programs, hackathons, etc. There's a lot out there. It feels to me like there are some parts missing and it's a little bit confusing. So we're looking at how we can help and get involved in that space to provide a little bit more clarity and direction for particularly female and diverse founders because mm. they struggle to access. They get less than two cents in the dollar mm. that other kinds of founders right, get. Right. 
improving the flow of money to different types of founders and improving the experience that they might have as founders. Mm -hmm. um, I'm involved in um, a, a couple of um, new business projects with um, a space that we bought recently. Mm -hmm. um, and we're looking to hold some kinds of events there, which we hope will be different and new, because we always like to do something that's different yeah. and, new and challenging. Um, and I'm also writing a, a, a book with a CFO on aspects of entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and also um, looking at how to connect um, different parts of the world with entrepreneurs. So spending a bit of time over in Southeast Asia, not so much in India, um, but mm -hmm. in Southeast Asia, um, looking at how we connect those. There's so many good solutions mm. to important problems that we have in the world yeah net, net zero um health uh loneliness uh, you know all, all those different kinds of problems a solution over here can be applied slightly differently here mm. we're quite good in the north northern europe and north american hegemony we're quite good at exporting our ideas we're not so good at importing the ideas mm. and there's so much richness in Correct. places like India and yep. Southeast Asia, yep. which is the place I'm familiar with. And I'm passionate about getting those people, those voices, those products, those services mm. out there, helping people get them out there. Mm. So we're doing some, some work with um, a couple of partners on trying to make that happen. Very interesting. Lisa, on that note, uh, thank you so much for speaking to me about your own amazing journey about Spring and Atlas. We went into a lot of discussion about coaching and mentoring. Thank you for some amazing uh, inputs you have given and I'm sure a lot of startups entrepreneurs will listen to our conversation and learn from you um, good luck with everything that you're doing and all the very best for Spring and Atlas in the future thank you thank you very much it's been a pleasure thank you for listening to the brand called you videocast and podcast a platform that brings you knowledge experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.